Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, my talk is about um, scheduling in semiconductor uh, backend production. Uh, this, is a, uh, this work is a, a collaboration project between uh, the Eindhoven University of Technology and uh, Nexperia. And this work is a joint effort of uh, uh, me, uh, Alp Aksai, uh, Joop Stockermans, and uh, Rick van der Dobbelsteen. So something short about the company. So uh, Nexperia, usually when I tell people that I work for Nexperia, they don't know this company, and that's because we split off from uh, NXP recently. We split off in 2017. And uh, you might know that Phil um, NXP is also a split off from uh, Philips uh, Semiconductors. They split off in uh, 2006. We have uh, approximately 12,000 uh, employees in Asia, Europe, and the uh, United States. Uh, our headquarters is in uh, Nijmegen. Um, there's no manufacturing in Nijmegen. That happens uh, uh, the front end, the wafer fabs, uh, they are in uh, Hamburg and uh, Manchester. This is where we uh, yeah, produce the wafers. These wafers are then uh, shipped to our uh, back end sites in uh, either the Philippines, Malaysia, or uh, China. Um, so the, yeah, these are the wafers. This is what we make in the, in the wafer fabs. And then when we ship them to, to Asia, we uh, um, uh, dice the wafers, which means that we separate them into the individual uh, uh, integrated circuits. And then uh, we also package them uh, into our final products. And we do that for um, approximately 90 billion uh, products annually. And uh, yeah, these are some of our uh, major customers. So you can imagine that on this scale that uh, scheduling is of real importance because yeah, we produce so many products that only uh, incremental improvement in the scheduling can already uh, uh, yeah, uh, have huge benefits. So in this work, I focus on uh, uh, the back-end production. So what happens at the back-end? Uh, the first thing that we do when the wafers arrive at uh, one of our back-end sites is uh, we do some testing, and we do that to identify if yeah, the wafer is, uh, uh, doesn't contain any defects because we won't, don't, don't want to run uh, uh, defect wafers uh, through our assembly process because that would be a waste. If the wafers are, uh, 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 don't contain too many defects, we dice the wafers, so we separate them into the individual components. And then we, they go through a process of dye bonding, wire bonding, and molding. And um, uh, that happens on these uh, BIM lines, uh, which stands for breakthrough in manufacturing. It's just a term from the, the 1990s when it actually was a yeah, breakthrough in manufacturing. But uh, uh, yeah, now 20 years later, we still, have, uh, we still use these machines. Um, and after this, uh, this process, uh, we separate the product. Uh, they are still on a, um, yeah, on, a, on a frame altogether. We have to separate them, and we have to run them through a final test before we uh, deliver them to our customers. Uh, so yeah, this dye bonding, wire bonding, and molding all happens on uh, uh, these BIM lines. Um, so the process looks uh, like this. So we have a, a lead frame, which is sort of like a tape that moves, moves uh, through the entire BIM line. And um, the first uh, machines that it passes through is uh, our dye bonding machines. And what happens at these machines is, is that we have a, a, a wafer. And this machine is picking up the dyes from the wafer and placing it on the lead frame. Uh, these are usually four machines in series. And then um, the next machines that uh, the lead frame runs through are the wire bonders. And what the wire bonders do is they make, uh, they make wires, which are the electrical connections between the dies and, uh, and the lead frame. And then usually at the end we have one molding machine, which is uh, encapsulating the, the chip in some, uh, in some molding compound. Um, now the problem that we face with these uh, machines is that uh, we have a very large uh, product portfolio. Um, and we only have uh, a limited number of, uh, of these BIM lines. So every time that we uh, have to uh, uh, use these machines for a different product, uh, this different product may use a different wafer, which means that we have to do some reconfigurations on the die bonders. It might require some different wires or different molding compounds. And all these reconfigurations, they, can, yeah, they take quite some time. And uh, yeah, that's the thing that we want to, to minimize. So that leads us to the uh, scheduling problem. Um, so I represented it here. Uh, this is a, a, yeah, one of the production schedules. So we have multiple BIM lines. We have much more than uh, three BIM lines. Uh, the gray blocks, they are the, the jobs, and the times in between, uh, they indicate the setup time. And the setup time is this, uh, yeah, sequence dependent. And also, because we have so many uh, different machines, we have different machines from different ages. 
So uh, for some machines, it's also more difficult to do a setup than for others. So the um, uh, the setup time depends, yeah, not only on the on the job but also on the machine. Um, some machines are faster than others, so we have uh, uh, machine-dependent process times. Um, we cannot produce all the products on all the machines, so uh, we have um, uh, machine eligibility constraints. And uh, from the factories, we also have the requirement to come up with a solution that gives the production schedule really fast, so we cannot take too long to come up with a, uh, with a, with a schedule. And as I said earlier, we have a very large product mix, uh, approximately 1,000 different products that we uh, produce on these machines. The objective is to uh, uh, minimize the setup time, all the setup time is, uh, is, is wasted capacity. Uh, we also want to pr uh, process everything as fast as possible. Uh, and we have to uh, yeah, satisfy the demand for our customers. So we have to uh, produce everything within uh, uh, a certain uh, deadline. Uh, for scheduling problems, uh, they usually use the three field notation. So I think for this problem it would look like this. So we have unrelated uh, parallel machines. We have sequence and machine-dependent setup times, we have machine eligibility constraints, and what we try to do is we try to minimize the uh, weighted sum of the setup times, the process times, and the tardiness. Um, already simpler scheduling problems are already MP-hard, so I think it's safe to say that this problem is also a, a, a very MP-hard problem. Um, so how do we attempt to solve it? So we developed a genetic algorithm to do this. Um, uh, at the core of the genetic algorithm, we have a population, and every, pop uh, every individual in this uh, population represents a, a complete uh, uh, production schedule, so it contains all the machines and all the orders that we have to schedule. We start the algorithm with some initialization, and um, uh, yeah, I will go into further detail of all these steps uh, in the next couple of slides, but it's just to give a yeah, high-level overview of the algorithm. So once we have the um, uh, initial population, uh, we start an evolutionary cycle with uh, selection, where we select randomly two individuals from the population. Uh, then we apply a crossover mechanism, where uh, uh, so we have two, we selected uh, two parents, and then we use some of the genetic material, so some of the production schedule from one parent, and uh, some of the other parent, and we create two new production schedules, what we call the offspring. Then with a certain probability, we uh, apply a mutation, which just means that we swap randomly some, some jobs in the production schedule. Then uh, we apply local search. In our case, we uh, decided to apply an uh, insertion neighborhood. Um, I'll also go into more detail on that later. And at that point, we have uh, yeah, two, uh, two new offspring, and we have to decide if we are going to allow them into the population or not. And that uh, has to satisfy two requirements. So uh, the first one is that it has to be unique. And the second thing is that uh, they have to be better than the uh, individuals that are already in the population. And that is decided based on this uh, uh, um, uh, objective function, which is, uh, like I said before, it's just a weighted sum of the setup times, the process times, and the tardiness. And this, uh, these evolutionary cycles, they go on for yeah, approximately 1,000 times. And then we see uh, uh, yeah, that uh, compared to the initial uh, initial population, the, the, yeah, the fitness of the population is uh, uh, getting better. And note that in this case, it's uh, our goal to yeah, minimize the fitness. We want to minimize the setup time, process time, and tardiness. Uh, now I want to go into a bit more detail of this algorithm. So um, uh, as I said before, we have the population uh, that consists of individuals, and every individual is a complete production schedule. So it contains all the machines and all the orders that we want to schedule. And then what we call a chromosome is uh, a yeah, single machine processing sequence. And uh, yeah, we refer to the genes as, the, um, as a single job. So this is how we do the initialization. Uh, what we want to do with this initialization, we want to create uh, uh, yeah, almost random uh, individuals, but we also want them uh, to be diverse. So this is how we do this. We start with uh, yeah, just all the orders and all the machines, and then we, sh we shuffle the list of orders, and then we just start at the beginning of this list, and we start assigning the orders. And we do this uh, yeah, basically in a greedy way, so uh, we evaluate all the positions where it can be placed, and then we uh, eventually we place the job at the position uh, that is optimal in terms of this uh, fitness function. Uh, 
Um, the next uh, uh, part in this uh, algorithm is um, uh, the crossover. Uh, the crossover uh, proceeds as follows. So we select uh, randomly two parents. And uh, at the start of this crossover, we only look at uh, parent one. And what we do with parent one, we, uh, uh, for every chromosome, we determine randomly a point in its uh, production sequence. And then um, every uh, job to the left of this, uh, um, to the left of this uh, production sequence moves to the first offspring, and every job to the right of this uh, random point moves to the second offspring. So now uh, we don't have complete production schedules, and this is where uh, the second pairs, parent uh, comes, into the, uh, uh, comes into play. Because what we do is uh, all the orders that aren't assigned yet, we are going to uh, introduce them. So we're going to look at uh, the second parent and all the jobs that we didn't assign in the offspring yet. We are going to insert them into uh, yeah, the respective offspring. And also this, we do this in a greedy way. So we always place the jobs that don't have a place in the production schedule yet. We place them uh, 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 at the best possible uh, insertion position. Um, after this, uh, we apply a local search uh, uh, mechanism. And what we do here is we take, uh, we take the offspring, we, we apply this to all offspring. And, um, uh, what we do here is we uh, rank all the, all the uh, uh, machine sequences. We rank them according to the fitness. So, the the okay, the whole um, the whole production schedule has um, has a has a has one fitness uh, yeah as its whole, but also every you can look at the fitness for every uh, single machine schedule as well. And according to this, we rank uh, the production schedule, and then we pick up. Um, uh, we look at the first uh, chromosome in this selection, and then for every job, we try to find a better, better position in the, in the whole uh, production schedule. And then if we uh, yeah, find an improvement, we accept it, and otherwise we, uh, we go on with the search. I want to illustrate that this is, yeah, this is a, a very important feature of the algorithm. Uh, I think this, uh, but for this example, we look at uh, 134 jobs, 17 machines, and we set all the, all the tunable uh, um, uh, weights in the objective function, we set them to one. And what you see here is that uh, uh, if we don't apply the local, local search, uh, the algorithm gets, uh, yeah, it doesn't, uh, it converges, but it's, um, yeah, not as well as if we apply the uh, local search method. I think this is a well-known feature for genetic algorithms. They, are, uh, they can be applied very well for global search, but for local search you need some, uh, some additional uh, operators. Um, here I want to illustrate the uh, tunability. So um, as a benchmark, we have the, the manual production schedule that's proposed by, by our planners. And then if we set all the uh, weights equal to one, uh, uh, this is uh, this is the output, and um, uh, yes, yeah, so some of the jobs they are still uh, overdue. We have some uh, uh, empty space here, which are probably the slower machine lines. Now, if we decide to uh, focus only on uh, the setup times and on the tardiness, and we don't focus on the process times anymore, we see that uh, also this empty space is also uh, filled with jobs. And another interesting one, I think, is is if we only focus on the tardiness. We see that we can uh, yeah, almost satisfy all the jobs within the due date, but uh, we do have to uh, allow a lot of uh, um, uh, long setup times. So with this I want to conclude. So I think um, I've shown that um, yeah, we have an effective method to determine uh, practically feasible production schedules. Uh, I think it's very important that user is also um, able to control the output of this, uh, this algorithm. And uh, at this moment, we also implemented this in a batch scheduler tool that's being used at our backend production sites. And in the future, we are now working on a paper where we uh, compare this algorithm also with uh, yeah, other algorithms available. Any questions? Any questions? The orange box is over there. <laughs> Just next to you. <laughs> I have a quick question. Um, your, um, there's time windows constraint on the jobs. I think I saw one of your objective. So when you do the GA and do crossover, wouldn't 
there be a possibility that the resulting solution may not be feasible? Um, yeah, I looked into this, but for this crossover mechanism is always going correct. You cannot create, because the, the, the offspring, or, or sorry, the parents, they are feasible. As long as the parents are feasible, the offspring will always be feasible. Why is uh, the guarantee is because, uh, let me go back to this one. So, um, so here we just yeah, split the yeah, first parent into two, basically. Right, so, so, so the jobs cannot have moved here in this step. They cannot have moved to a, to a, to a different machine. So it's still feasible. Mm -hmm. And now we take the first machine of parent two, and we look at which jobs haven't been assigned yet, which in um, this case are uh, two, four, one, and five. And these are then inserted into this machine, the machine number one. Yeah, so it, in doing that, you change the sequence. You change and so the, the time window uh, may, be, may be violated? The time window may jobs. be violated, yes, yes. So that, is that, that may considered okay for a feasible solution? Well, I, say, I, I thought it was feasible. It, it's, it's still feasible. I mean, if you don't satisfy the schedule window, it's still feasible. But that's, yeah, you just get a bad objective function. But uh, it's a soft constraint, yeah, yeah. I Any thought you meant that the machine eligibility, a job cannot move to an ineligible machine through this uh, mechanism. Yeah, I thought it's a hard constraint. Any other question? Um, so, uh, as I saw about the um, multi-objective function, you didn't use any normalized weighted function. So, uh, the normalization is not there. Maybe uh, when you're not normalizing, the one that has the highest value in Korea, for example, one objective has a two order of magnitude that yeah. can really guide the search in some way. And so why didn't uh, use a normalize and you have any, your choice? Yeah, this was indeed an issue when we, uh, when we, when we implemented the tool and uh, um, yeah, we had to tune this. And this was, yeah, it's a user controllable thing so the planner can also influence where they want to emphasize, uh, yeah, where, where they want to put emphasis. And it can also, um, yeah, so, so what they do is they run the tool and then they look at the schedule and then yeah, they can still, still tune it a little bit. But my idea is that if you use a normalization, like an estimation of the F minus F, uh, so the ideal uh, objective function and the worst uh, objective function for this uh, of the multi-objective, and then you normalize, maybe you know you will have a more ponderated way of doing the guiding. You, you get my, maybe we can talk after in more detail. Okay. Yeah, I think in the interest of time, uh, we will have to close the session so that we don't uh, get long, involved in the long queues at lunchtime. Uh, on behalf of uh, everyone, uh, and let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you.